So we're going to dive into the respiratory system and we're going to start off with just a general overview and a peek at the anatomy. So taking a look, our respiratory system is split up into two different sections. We have the upper respiratory tract and the lower respiratory tract. So we're going to first take a look at the functions of our upper airway that we have. Now the functions that we have are threefold. One, it is used to uh, warm the air. So when we have outside colder air coming into our body, we want it to be able to be heated up and match the temperature of our bodies by the time that it hits the lungs. Otherwise, it can start to cool off the lungs a little too much. And the technique that we use or the how we end up doing that within the body is through creating turbulence in the system. So we'll talk about how that actually happens and anatomically how that happens. However, it does create this turbulence in the system and it makes it so that it is coming in contact with a lot of surface area that has underneath that surface area warm blood approaching to it, which will transfer the heat from that surface area to the air itself. So that is one of our functions of our upper airway. The second function that we have is to actually filter the air. Now, if we look around at the air that's around us, you'll notice that it looks pretty clean, depending on where you're from. However, as we all know, there are particles that are found within the air, and we don't want those getting into the lungs because the lungs are a sterile environment. So we will filter it, and we do that by using cilia or hairs that are located all along the nasal passages. So when we're taking a look, you can see in this picture up here, we've got these cilia that are in the nasal passages and it's just acting as a filter. It's basically a trap that is catching any of these particles that we don't want to be making it down to the lungs. Here's the microscopic version of that where you can actually see these little hairs or these cilia that are collecting things to be able to keep everything sterile by the time it gets to the lungs. The third function that we have of the upper airway system is to humidify the air. So air is typically warm inside the lungs and it also is wet. So we actually have wetness. Just think about the last time that you blew on a piece of glass and you could see that fogging up that's combined with the heat and also with the moisture that has been absorbed into the air as it is traveling down to get into our lungs. So how we do this is actually through what are called goblet cells. And you can see these in the picture right here. These are our goblet cells that the cilia are attached onto. And these goblet cells that you can see here are producing fluid. And this fluid, it can release into the nasal passage to add little bits of moisture to the air as it's traveling down the nasal passage. So our three functions of the upper airway system is to warm, filter, and humidify the the air before it gets down into the lungs themselves. Now we have our, fun, our regions of our pharynx. We have the nasopharynx, which is all the way from the nose up to where the uvula drops down. So this is our nasopharynx. We have our oropharynx that goes from the mouth all the way through to here, the uvula again. And then below that, these two combine together to create the laryngopharynx, which you can see from the uvula as it travels down until we are are at the level of the trachea. So in the nasopharynx, this is where we have our turbinates or also known as our conche. And these are what's providing that increased surface area for the air to come in contact with. You can see the pictures of them right here. And it's creating that turbulence to create that warmth within the air. The oropharynx is largely made up of the teeth and the tongue. And the laryngopharynx is uh, made up of the thyroid cartilage that we have. A lot of times we think of it as the Adam's apple. As it's sticking out, it's that anterior prominence that we have right at the front of our, at the beginning of where our trachea comes down. And it's also location of the cricoid cartilage, in case you've ever heard of that when taking a CPR class. So that's what we can see within the laryngopharynx. 
Here's just another picture. Here you can see these turbinate as they are located in the nasal passages and they are covered with skin, with surface area. That air is going to come into here. It's going to circle around and create the turbulence and come in contact with all of that surface area to increase the warmth of the air. So you can see that. I also want to point out in this particular picture the tongue. So here is our tongue right here, and we think of the tongue usually as just being this little tip that you can see, and then sometimes we can reach back and actually see uh, towards the back of the tongue. That's not actually the back of the tongue that we're seeing. This in entirety is the back of the tongue, and I just want you to appreciate it as far as it is one of the larger um, structures that we have, and it can cause um, issues when we are trying to give rescue breaths, such as in with CPR, because it can drop down to the back of the throat. And that's because it's so heavy because of that big man, that big muscle that it is. Now looking at a cadaveric picture. So this is as if I were to take a slice of the face this way and we're looking out through the eyes. So this is actually a picture of a cadaver. And here you can see these concha or these turbinates. And you can see that's just like this small area that the air can pass through in our nasal passages. And that's why it is creating that turbulence and how much surface area it's coming in contact with will increase that warmth. So this is why in particular, we are obligate nose breathers. What does that mean? It means that we were made to breathe through our nose. Yes, we can breathe through our mouths, but it is not the way that we were actually designed in order to breathe on a regular basis. And if you don't believe me, just think of the last time that you were sick and had a plugged nose and had to sleep while breathing through your mouth. It's a very disruptive way to do it and your mouth gets really dry and you end up coughing a lot, right? Because we are actually made to breathe through our nose. Now, I'm also just wanting to show you a couple of our sinuses. So when you get like sinus pressure buildup when you're sick, that's also appearing here in these collections. So these, these open spaces will start to fill with fluid. You can actually see them up here. That's where the, on your forehead, the frontal sinuses, in which you would actually be feeling that pressure, as well as next to the nose underneath the eyes is a common place, as well as some other sinuses that we have here. So they're made just to have air. They're actually the reason we have them is to make the skull lighter. Otherwise, if that was full of bone, the skull would be a very heavy structure. Um, but it's made to have open air in them. And when we start to get fill the uh, buildup of fluid inside of it, that's when we can feel that pressure. So that's our upper airway system. Now let's take a look at our lower airway. So the conduction region begins at the trachea. As it's traveling here, the trachea down into the lungs. And it contains in its full structure here approximately 150 cc's or milliliters of air in the adult. So this is air that is just holding these structures open, that is just contained within all of the cartilage that is here. And it's not actually where gas exchange is happening, but it's just existing in these spaces. So this is our conduction region in which it's moving air in between. Then we uh, let's just split it up into just a little bit more detail. So we have our trachea that's coming down. It divides into our bronchi, and then it'll divide off even more to our bronch uh, to smaller bronchi, and ultimately to our bronchioles, which you cannot see on this picture, and also into the alveoli, also not pictured in this um, particular picture that we're looking at. And all of this is contained within the lungs. So to look at it in a little bit closer of a view and what you can see without the lungs in the way. So we have our larynx right here, then coming into our trachea. The trachea divides down into our primary bronchi. Each of our primary bronchi or our first set of bronchi will divide again into our secondary bronchi and then into our tertiary bronchi, the third division that we have here. Now, what I want you to notice about the trachea is that the cartilage 
that makes up the trachea is in the shape of a C, leaving the back opening. Now, you might be asking, why does it do that? Well, a couple of different reasons. One is so that if anything that is traveling, that happens to travel down the trachea as it's not supposed to, because usually just air is traveling down the trachea, we've got this muscle set up right here so that it can actually expand on it and it can go into the area where the esophagus is and things don't get stuck within this hard cartilage. Same thing with our esophagus, as we swallow a large bolus of food, it can stretch into the trachea just a little bit as it's going down the esophagus into our stomachs for digestion without getting stuck because it doesn't have the hard cartilage on this other side. So all of our cartilages in our trachea are actually C-shaped. The only exception that we have is right above that, which is our cricoid cartilage. Our cricoid cartilage is one that is an entire ring around, but that's located within our larynx. So following this down, we had our trachea, remember, and then it split into our primary bronchi. This primary bronchi splits again to a second time and is now our secondary bronchi. Then it splits again into our tertiary bronchi. And ultimately, it still has cartilage in these bronchi all the way down until we hit the bronchioles. The bronchioles are characterized by not, by not having cartilage and instead just being smooth muscle. These bronchioles will then lead into the terminal bronchioles and then the respiratory bronchioles, ultimately to the alveolar sacs, with each one of them being made up of alveoli. So looking at our branching, this is a cadaveric picture that has the different structures and cartilages dyed from lungs. So we had our trachea that was coming down to be able to deliver air to the lungs and it splits off into that primary bronchi and switches again or splits off again into the secondary and the tertiary. And what you're seeing with these different colors that we have here are the ending regions of each of the different bundles of the tertiary bronchi. So you can see those as they're all heading out into the different areas of the lungs. So really when we're looking at the lungs, it ends up looking more like it is a sponge as compared to like a balloon when you're looking at it in structure. Here's a cadaveric picture again that just shows you the outside picture of the lungs. So we have our lungs right here. This is our right lung and our left lung. This is the diaphragm that helps us to be able to breathe, which we'll talk about in just a moment, with our liver underneath it. Um, what I want you to take a look at is how our right lung is separated into two different sections. We have the superior lobe, and then we have the middle middle lobe and then also the, the uh, inferior lobe. So it's three different sections on the right side. On the left side is where we see only two different structures. We have the superior lobe and the inferior lobe. And the reason why is because our heart takes up space that is coming into the place where the left lobe is or where the left lung is. And so there's just not enough space that it ended up through evolution only having two lobes on this left side, but three still on the right side. Now, if you look at these lungs, you can actually see some of these darkened colored structures that are in here. That is actually pollution that has damaged the lung. So you can actually see, uh, and most likely it's smoking. So this is actually probably a smoker that came through and you can actually see that damage being done on the lung itself instead of it being nice pinkish tissue. As we go deeper into the lung and we get to the alveoli, this is where it has the exchange region. So we had the conduction region, which is that movement of air. Coming down to the exchange region at the level of the alveoli, which is where the gas exchange actually takes place. It, has, it occurs within the respiratory bronchioles and the alveoli. 
what I really want you to picture is that you um, don't just have one alveolus, right? You have a bunch of alveoli. And when you cut open the alveolar sac, what you'll notice is tons of surface area here made throughout these alveoli that comes in contact with air and then transfers that air into the bloodstream through this netting of capillaries that is located all around each alveolus. So we have a netting of different blood vessels, these capillaries that are coming through and surrounding each alveolus to be able to provide the gas exchange between the air that's coming in through the lung and the gases that are in our capillaries and in our bloodstream. So taking a look at this gas exchange, this is our function of this lower airway is to be able to have gas exchange. So it's the exchange mainly of oxygen and carbon dioxide signified by O2 for oxygen and carbon dioxide for uh, CO2. And what I want you to notice is that the cells right here on the capillaries as well as on the alveoli are one cell thick each. And what that means is that it actually allows for the diffusion of the gases to be able to cross this barrier because this is so thin of a barrier. So our oxygen that we just breathed in can come from the alveoli and move into the capillaries to be bound with these red blood cells. And then through metabolism, we have accumulated a lot of carbon dioxide that's been carried around in the body through the bloodstream and now can deposit it into the alveoli to be able to exhale it out to the outside world. Looking at some fun and interesting uh, uh, statistics that we have within our lungs. So the average lung volume is around four to six liters. That's what can be contained within the lung. And the average weight of the lung is around one kilogram, so about 2.21 pounds. The lungs themselves, each one contains 300 million alveoli. I'm going to repeat that again because that is just an astounding number. 300 million alveoli. And each alveolus is about 0.3 millimeters in diameter. That's so incredibly small. We're talking like, you know, we're essentially needing a microscope to be able to actually see them. Well, these alveoli are all highly vascularized. Um, at rest, each red blood cell passes about two to three alveoli in about a half a second to a second in its transit. So each red blood cell is passing through these alveoli through these capillaries, and it's happening in only about a second's time period, which means it allows for us to be able to have a lot of gas exchange because it's passing by so many, like uh, several alveoli um, and coming in contact with it. The average surface area of all of these alveoli, if you were to take these all out and stretch them from end to end, it would be about the size of half of a tennis court. So that's how much gas exchange can actually happen when we are working with the lung. So how does this all work? So we have air that is coming in into the lungs, ultimately going through the trachea to the bronchi, the secondary bronchi, and the tertiary bronchi into the bronchioles, into the terminal and respiratory bronchioles, and then ultimately into the alveolar sac. Then we have this exchange between the alveolus and the capillaries, which is going to drop off carbon dioxide into the alveolus and pick up oxygen, transport that to the heart where it's going to now pump out to go to the rest of the body, to the rest of our cells. And here is where we're going to actually 
do another gas exchange. And it's going to take all of this fresh, clean oxygen that we just, that we just had accumulated here in the lung, this fresh, clean oxygen, and it's going to deliver it into the cells themselves. And then through metabolism, we're producing carbon dioxide. And this carbon dioxide is going to go back into the capillaries to now be transported through the veins all the way back up to the capillaries to be able to release it into the alveolus and be able to exhale that out. So that's kind of the flow of how we get fresh air all the way from the alveoli down to the cellular level and then how we go backwards from that cellular level all the way back up to the lung itself. So the how we actually do this is through the process called ventilation. So respiration was our exchange of gases. Ventilation is our movement of air. So this is the process in which air is brought into the lungs so that respir respiration can take place. And it is the movement in and out of the lungs. And it has different phases. We have the inspiration phase, which the primary rest, the primary muscle that we have for inspiring is the diaphragm, but we also have intercostal muscles, muscles that are located in between the ribs that can also help to contract as well as a few others. And air ends up being drawn into the lungs like a vacuum. So when we contract, we're going to create this space within the lungs. And to balance that out, more air is going to come in through the mouth and the nose to be able to fill up that space. Then we can simply relax those muscles which will then return it back to a smaller volume and it will end up exhaling or expiring the air out. Let's take another picture of this. So here, what you can see is our muscles of inspiration. Primarily, it's the diaphragm, but you can also have the intercostal muscles, specifically the external intercostal muscles, as well as some of our scaling muscles and our sternocleidomastoid. These are ones that are located within our neck. Then to exhale, we can actually just relax these. However, sometimes we need to more forcefully get air out. And to do that, we actually have some muscles that we can contract, such as our internal intercostal muscles, the ones found here in between the uh, ribs, as well as our abdominal muscles. So like our obliques that we have here, external and internal obliques, and our rectus abdominis. So we can get more forceful of an air compression if we want to, but typically it's just us relaxing these inspiration muscles in order to exhale our air. So I'm going to show you a little picture and kind of try to describe to you how this actually all works. So our lungs are surrounded by a very thin membrane called our pleural membrane. And it actually ends up folding over on itself. So it's attached onto the lung itself, but then it folds over on itself and works its way around and is attached to the actual chest wall cavity. So this one that is located attached onto the chest wall cavity is called our parietal pleura. The one that's actually located on the lung itself is our visceral pleura. These two membranes together are suctioned because of a small amount of serous fluid that is located in between the two layers, which is called our pleural cavity. The cavity is this, the potential space that's in between it. So looking at it and trying to equate it to what we see here with a balloon. So here we've got an air-filled balloon, and that is representing our actual lung itself, where air is coming in. Then we have another balloon, but instead of air, it's filled with fluid. And this balloon actually wraps around the whole outer edge of this air-filled balloon. This is our parietal and visceral pleura that we have. So, and once we stretch it all the way out and it's coming here, we have our parietal pleura, 
We have our visceral pleura and we have this potential space in between, which is our pleural cavity. Now, what happens because of this suctioning that we have right here is that whenever we end up pulling on this parietal pleura to come out, it will suction to our visceral pleura and it will pull it along with it, which is attached onto the outside of the lung, which means it takes this lung or this air filled space and also pulls it out. When I do that, it creates a vacuum in here because I just took this space and I made it larger. By making it larger, it creates a vacuum and it ends up pulling air from the outside world into the lungs themselves. So we're gonna take a look at a picture of this in, in kind of action, so to say, so to speak. So here we have our lung. Here we have the visceral pleura and the parietal pleura, and in between is that pleural space or that pleural cavity. Here we've got our diaphragm, the main muscle of respiration. And at rest, the diaphragm is actually relaxed and it's kind of in this concave, or excuse me, convex, I would actually say, uh, pattern. Now what happens is I flatten my diaphragm so it pulls it into this flat uh, shape. By doing that, whoops, by doing that, what we're gonna see is that we have this volume of the lung that is going to increase because attached onto the diaphragm is our parietal pleura, which is suctioned to, because of that fluid, into uh, suctioned to the visceral pleura that we have right here which is attached onto the lung, which creates now more volume and space inside the lung. Think of this section that we have of these pleura as like taking two panes of glass. Remember back in biology class a long time ago in school, and you would put a drop of fluid in between those two panes of glass that you're trying to look at on a microscope. And what ends up happening is you can kind of move the two pieces of glass around on each other, but if you tried to pull them apart, there's a section that's created and isn't allowing them to pull apart. Well, that's what happens when we have this little tiny bit of serous fluid in this pleural space or the pleural cavity, and it's suctioning the parietal and the visceral pleura together, which is now attached to the chest wall cavity and the lung itself. So wherever the chest wall cavity goes, the lung will go also. Then in order to actually expire, all we have to do is release the tension on this muscle. It goes back into the resting position. By doing that, it takes this larger space and shrinks it up to be a smaller space of the lung again. By doing that, it increases the pressure inside of the lung, which will then lead us to expire. Now, the alveolar cells really don't contain any muscles themselves, but connective tissues are there that are uh, containing what are called elastin fibers. And you can kind of see them there. It's like little rubber bands that are all around on our alveoli. And what it's doing is they are trying to collapse the lung here, right? So they're like pulling everything in tight together. Ultimately, what that's doing is pulling all of the lung tight in together, which the lung would collapse, except that it is actually connected to the chest wall cavity, which is trying to pull its way out. So I want you to think of this like a pair of tongs, right? So our chest wall is really expanded at rest because of the muscles that we have. Now this expansion while it's at rest, is trying to pull and recoil the chest wall out, but it needs some kind of an inward force to compress the chest wall. Well, our lungs themselves are trying to be compact at rest because of the elastin fibers. And we can visualize that as if it was like rubber bands, right? So we had the rubber bands that are this, trying to create this compactness when we're at rest. 
and it takes an outward force in order to expand them. So when you combine these two different forces, the force of the tongs and rubber bands, or the force of the chest wall and the lungs, the chest wall is slightly compressed by that inward pulling of the lungs, and the lungs are somewhat expanded by the chest wall because of its natural tendency to come out. So then we can further ask this question, what happens when there's la less elastic recoil on the lungs? So what if I took off a couple of rubber bands off of my tongs to make them open up more openly? Well, then you're going to have a buildup of air that's retaining within the alveoli themselves. And what happens if there's excess connective tissue in the lungs, things that are holding it together? So maybe instead of even having rubber bands, we ended up tying a string around the tongs. Well, by doing that and having that connective tissue or scarring that's built up, it's going to make it less likely for the lungs to be able to expand. And that's what we can call are like pleuritis or having this buildup or a fibrosis that we have. So that was our ventilation of the air. Now remember, we also have the respiration of our air, and that is the exchange of gases between the living organism and its environment. And the main ones that we are dealing with is oxygen and carbon dioxide. And it crosses in two different barriers. It exchanges oxygen and carbon dioxide both across the alveolar capillary ba barrier that's located within the lungs and also at the cellular level between the capillaries and the cells. So these are labeled as two different types of respiration. The external respiration is what happens in the lungs and the internal respiration is what happens in the cells. So that's what's going to stop us right here. We're going to move on to our next video, and you can learn about why we breathe and the challenges of the system while we are exercising.